Welcome everyone to the School of Wisdom, Breakwater Church. We are investigating the history of the origins of Matthew's gospel. And we're looking at the history of that. And then we're also looking at the hysteria. So we have the <clears throat> anchor of history and we also have the anarchy. So this is part four. Today is <clears throat> the 8th of February, uh, 2022. So we've done three parts before this. So I'll backtrack a little bit for those of you just jumping in right now and <clears throat> get us up to speed. So I want to start with some anarchy here. So this is a commentary by Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. It's called the JFB. Part five, introduction to Matthew. Now I have this electronically on BibleSoft. I thought I had it in my library, but I, everything's been moved around so much I can't find it. But what I wanted to do here was go through this painstakingly, see how far we get, and then we'll go back and look at the anchor of history. All right? All in favor? Yeah. You and the crowds in the back? <clears throat> All right, so now let's read this together, shall we? This is their commentary on the introduction to Matthew. It is believed by a formidable number of critics that this gospel was originally written in what is loosely called Hebrew, but more accurately, Aramaic. Now that's important because sometimes it's, they call it Hebrew, sometimes they call it Aramaic, but Aramaic is the language of the Hebrew people at that time. Hebrew was a religious language. So there's, they're interchangeable. You'll see that in the historical record. But what they're pointing out here is that when you use the word Hebrew, they're actually mean Aramaic or Syro-Chaldaic, which is Syrian language, the Syriac language, okay? There's, in that whole area right there, there's a huge history of the Aramaic language and still comes down to us in Syriac, okay? So it's the native tongue of the country at the time of our Lord and the Greek Matthew, which we now possess is a translation of that work, either by the evangelist himself or by some unknown hand. So this is a good summary. And it should be the end of the discussion of the origin and the nature of the first gospel in the New Testament. Matthew wrote first, Matthew wrote in Aramaic and Greek is a translation. Now the JFB, which is the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary, will list voices of history that confirm that. So now they're going to go into that, a list of the number of the critics that support this view. So I have key points in red that represent the, the uh, commentary. My comments are in parentheses and we'll slowly make our way through. So here's the evidence. This is, this is a quote from there. The evidence, now, that's a strong word, isn't it? That's a good word. The evidence referred to is the following. This is the beginning of their list of the formidable chain. Papias. We've already talked about him. We'll come back to him. He is a bishop, highly regarded. And he says that Matthew drew up the oracles. Look here. This is their parentheses. Meaning his gospel. Now, this is significant because... As time goes on, that's even questioned so that whatever Papias called the oracles of the Lord is no longer the gospel. Okay, this is a huge concession on their part. So it's the gospel in the Hebrew dialect. Irenaeus says, Matthew among the Hebrews put forth a written gospel in his own tongue. Pantaneus, we're going to look at him today, was recorded, was reported to have gone to India to preach the gospel. And when he was in India... He found Matthew's gospel in Aramaic, in the Hebrew letters, of course, that the apostle Bartholomew left there. Awesome. Yeah. Can you believe that? No. Would awesome. you ever know this even existed? Right. No, you never know about this. Now, Jerome, who's an amazing figure in all church history, an incredible intellect scholar, he says in two places that in... In two different places, you see the word and right there? Okay, that means one and two. Uh, on his return to Alexandria, Pantaneus brought it back with him. So not only did Pantaneus go to India, find the Gospel of Matthew, but he brought it back. Okay, origin. The first Gospel was written by him. 
the apostle Matthew in Hebrew for Jewish believers, okay? These are all very early, very key leaders in the Christian chain. Eusebius, the, the, church, the church historian, Matthew, first gospel to the Hebrews, delivered first preaching, then in writing, uh, the gospel according to him, Matthew in his native tongue. You find that in Eusebius' history, 5, 10, 2, if you want to look it up. This means ecclesiastical history, which is the history of the church, uh, book 6, 25. Okay, there's, there, these are all footnoted. So we talked about Jerome. We'll look at Jerome, but not tonight. He's significant, and we need to spend some time with him to really appreciate his contribution to this situation. So he says in his own commentary these things, quoting, Matthew first composed the gospel of Christ in Judea. Where? We know where. For the benefit of whom? Jewish believers. How? In the Hebrew tongue and character, which means in their script. That makes sense. Afterward, translated into Greek. So which comes first, the Greek or, or the Aramaic? Mm -hmm. the Aramaic comes first. Make common sense. And, but I, I like this too. It's not sufficiently certain who translated it. So instead of making something up that can't be actually proven, they say it's uncertain. But they're not uncertain about Matthew's gospel. Are you with me? It's clear. And this is Jerome up into the fourth century, later in the fourth century. Moreover, the very Hebrew gospel is in the library of Caesarea, which means you can go to that library and look and touch the Aramaic gospel of Matthew. Okay? This is the guy that translated the Bible into Latin that became the Vulgate for, you know, a thousand years, the Bible of the Latin speaking church. This guy is a you know, top scholar. He knows what Matthew's gospel looks like. Okay. So this library was collected with the greatest diligence. He says, I myself also translated it with the permission of the Nazarenes who make use of that volume in Borea, a, a town of Syria. So this is uh, a town in Syria Syrian-speaking people, which the Aramaic-speaking people of that region, have a gospel of Matthew accessible in the library where they can go copy it. That's why it's there. It is the exemplar. And then there's uh, the. And then Jerome speaks of the gospel used by the Nazarenes and Ebenites, uh, which we recently translated from Hebrew into Greek. So Jerome says we translate that one from Hebrew into Greek. And which is by most called the what? Authentic gospel of Matthew. Okay, how, how clear is Jerome about this? Is there any doubt in his mind what he's touched and used and saw for himself and held in his hands and translated? No doubt whatsoever. This is one of the formidable chain of our anchor. Epiphanius. Epiphanius. Call it whatever you want. So he's saying regarding this gospel that the Nazarenes use, what they call the gospel according to the Hebrews was just the original in the Hebrew tongue and character of Matthew's gospel, all right? Four centuries, how far? 400 years, okay? So this is their conclusion, and then I want you to see how it all unravels. He just gave us the, the evidence for their first summary, which says is a formidable chain in critics who tell you this summary and they gave it to you. Matthew wrote in Aramaic, Matthew wrote early, Matthew's translated into Greek. He shows it very convincingly from this. And he calls this chain of testimony is formidable. Anybody know what formidable means? Really strong, really big. Uh, it's It's solid, yeah. unassailable, you know? Right. Now, especially as it is unbroken, there being no external testimony to the contrary. What does that mean? That means that you can't, you can't uh, argue it. You can't find anyone in, in 400 years that would disagree with this. Right. 
Now look what happens here in the modern commentaries. But, the big but, okay? It's one of the biggest buts in the world. When closely examined, will not, we believe, be found to bear the weight laid upon it. So we just told you all this history. They gave you all this testimony from all these people. He says it's, un it's formidable, unbroken. But now he's going to be the contrary voice. He's going to say, when you look at this closely, it's not going to bear the weight. So now he gets into this thing that the J JFB, there is the strongest reason to suspect. Okay. Now, does that sound like evidence anymore for that? There's no reasons given for it. It's just what we want to believe. It's not what, the, what it's, it's centered in anything. If you want to believe something, believe what history told you, right? There is the strongest reason to suspect that most of the testimonies about Matthew's gospel are, after all, just one testimony, that of Papias, repeated from hand to hand. Now, that is blatant error. In other words, what they're saying is all these people, all they're doing is repeating what Papias said, the second century bishop. So if you follow along, I think we did that last week, Matthew and Papias. So we looked at him. We'll look at him again just briefly. But I want, to, I want you to see the sleight of hand way that they denigrate Papias in anything that he said. Now, he is a bishop, which means a leader of an entire region in the Christian church with links directly to the apostles themselves as we saw last week. So they act like if you repeat the tradition of Papias, it is by that nature wrong. You get what I'm saying here? Yeah. It's just Papias. Well, has Papias been proven to be wrong? <laughs> no, but they've ganged up on Papias and they've just decided somehow we believe, right? We have the strongest reason to suspect Papias of being wrong. The other thing you want to see here is the testimony of Papias is linked to the very copy of the Aramaic Gospel of Matthew as retrieved by Pantanus. So there's a big discussion in our era that Papias wasn't even talking about the Gospel of Matthew. He's talking about Q. He's talking about a document. He's talking about anything other than the Gospel of Matthew. So they're going to shred Papias and his Logia, his, his oracles. But for these guys right now, the thing that Papias is talking about in terms of the oracles of our Lord Jesus, the Logia, are the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, keep that somewhere back in your mind, okay? Now he's got to shred Irenaeus, who is another bishop of Lyon, who took the position as bishop from someone who was martyred for the faith, okay? And he is a prolific writer and fortunate for us that we have a large collection of his writings that continue to our day and translate English and we have them accessible. Okay. Really cool guy. So Irenaeus had the greatest regard for all that Papias wrote. Now that's going to become a bad thing because Papias is radioactive. Okay. Papias has to be diminished. So the fact that Irenaeus has regard for Papias now, what? Shadows him, all right? Are you with me? And so when Irenaeus talks about the Gospel of Matthew, he must have had his statement on this subject. And Irenaeus, he says, says nothing himself in addition, which is not true. And we will look at that. This is why it's important to actually go back and read primary sources. Because what we're reading now is what somebody says somebody said. So it's like telephone. And they can tell you whatever they want. Now, back in the day when information was only available through books, you had to trust people. You, you didn't have an opportunity to actually go back and find out what Papias really said, what Irenaeus really said. It was almost impossible to get that kind of information, even in my lifetime as a young student in the Bible. You had to go to esoteric, theological cemeteries, go down the archives to find these books. Nowadays, you can buy the whole set of the 
uh, the father's 40, 40 volumes, whatever it is. Uh, you can buy the whole set now. They've been reprinted. And you can get them on, online. So you can, I, I have this whole set of the NTC and Post NTC and 1 and 2 fathers on digital. Can you believe that? What an era we live in. So anybody can look this up now. Okay, anybody. So they say that Irenaeus is nothing. He's just echo. It's just an echo. As if the faithful transmission of apostolic tradition is suspect if it's faithfully relayed. You get what I'm saying? We, we want to echo faithful tradition. We got to contend for faith as delivered. We're not making things up. We're, we want to echo the gospel all through every generation exactly as it was delivered. Absolutely. So the fact that Irenaeus faithfully regards Papias so highly and confirms his statement further lends credibility to what Papias said as being reliable apostolic tradition. Anybody with me on that? So... In the new era, Pappas becomes radioactive. Anything he touches bad. So if you can relate him to Papias in some way, then whatever information Irenaeus has is suspect. But what we're saying is that Irenaeus holds Papias in higher regard. What does JFB do? They discard him. They trash him, right? So we have a choice. Do we not? We can choose the anchor of history or the anchor of anti-history. Okay. What the JFB is doing right now is perverting history by fabricating a fictional re-narrative describing events which did not occur. So check it out. The JFB wrote, here's the evidence. The evidence referred to is the following. And they give evidence, Papias, Irenaeus. Ateneos, Origen, Eusebius, Jerome, and Epiphanios. And then they posted that there is no external testimony to the contrary. And this chain of testimony is formidable, especially since it's unbroken. And then what they do is present as much contradicting evidence as they can possibly find based upon nothing except their presuppositions. Just a guess. We believe, we think. Okay, so now they go on to origin. At some point we'll look at him because, again, he's really important. He got a lot of things to say about him. So now we're now we're going to dispatch origin. The, the The circumstances of origin are what? What's he going to say? Suspicious. Can you believe that? So. He's saying that it's only through Eusebius. Now, Eusebius, we're having trouble with Eusebius, right? That it's reported by him what Origen thought. Origen is not said to have ascertain as a, as a fact and consequence of his investigation. So, in other words, we don't know from Origen, as his own personal investigations, that uh, Matthew's gospel was written early, as we was talking about, and in America. But merely, he merely learned it by tradition. As if that's a problem. You understand? That's not a problem. That's a good thing. What tradition? The unbroken chain of history. It's, it's not said that he ever has seen it. Does he need to see it? This gospel, and, and he's a very energetic guy, wrote all kinds of things, made biblical inquiries. It's not said that he, that he believed in the tradition. Now that's wrong. We will read Origen and find out exactly what he said. You have just twisted things there. You twisted Origen. It's very clear what Origen says. We're not going to get him today. We're just going to look at one section today. And then Origen speaks of the Greek as if it were the one and only origin of, of Matthew. But did Origen say that Greek was the original Matthew? Or because Origen uses Greek, this guy interprets that to mean he thought it was the original. So you put a lot of words in his mouth for a guy who speaks Greek using a Greek translation. Okay? <laughs> if I'm English, I want an English translation. 
Kurt uses the English translation. Therefore, he believes Matthew was written in English. Do you see what I'm saying? <sighs> so check this out now. In several places, he, Jerome, let's make that red, refers to the Gospel of Hebrews as a work known to be in existence. So now he goes back, flips a bit, goes back to history, and says, Jerome, yeah, he does mention it, that it actually exists. Now, it's the gospel of the Hebrews, okay? It exists. But he doesn't use it because why should he? He just probably doesn't speak Aramaic. He speaks Greek. I don't speak Greek. I'm going to use Greek. I'm going to use a Greek word every now and then I have tools. I'm not going to use Hebrew. I'm going to use English, sometimes Spanish. So because he spoke Greek and didn't use the Aramaic Hebrew, he says that didn't have any authority. What are you reading his mind? So he says, this is enough to throw doubt over the whole tradition. Oh. What tradition? The seven chain of formidable, unbroken tradition. This is, this is enough. I've done it. I've overthrown history. Way to go, guys. So what we will find out is that Origen is not a parrot. He's just not repeating some mantra from Papias. When we look at what Origen says, we'll see that he's got independent tradition about the Aramaic origin of Matthew that in his expert opinion is correct. Now, of course, he speaks Greek. He doesn't speak Aramaic. Why should he even talk about it? So there are, um, so these are among the seven of the chain that they've listed that have, that, so there are people in this chain that have actually touched the Aramaic gospel, looked at it, okay? And Jerome was one of them. So check out what here, because we're going to get to this guy, and this is why this is important. The Pantena story has to go away. You cannot believe anything that history tells you about Pantanus and his story to India and his finding the Aramaic gospel and bring it back. So it, this is now this is the JFB speaking here, okay? The Pantena story wears a very mythical air. Where does that come from? He just made that entire historic record of everything that has to do with Pantanus as a myth. Like these guys got nothing better to do. <laughs> nothing better to do than to make up myths. You know, let's, let's, let's make Pantheus a myth also. You know, let's make the church in Alexandria a myth. Anyway, I just want you to see this. So Eusebius merely says, now the word merely is indicative of where he's going with Eusebius. It's a mere thing. It's not like Eusebius actually says, it's merely says. But does he say it? He does say it. That he went to India, he found the Hebrew Matthew. Now check this out. Jerome echoes Eusebius. But now here we see that he adds, right? Right? Now, Jerome's going to add to Eusebius. So is he just echoing just Eusebius if he's adding to Eusebius? He's adding to Eusebius. That he brought it back with him to Alexandria. So not only did Pantaneus go to India, which was opened up, and you could travel there. You know, Bartholomew went there. Thomas went to India, died in South India, right, as a martyr. And brought it back to Alexandria. What a treasure. So he went to India. Now check this out. Maybe South Arabia. Maybe Southern Arabia. That's likely enough. No, he went to India. <laughs> Why do you just make this up? Just made it up. Yeah, no, he, he couldn't really have gone there. So uh, without inquiring too critically into the Indian part of the story. So we're not even going to think about the Indian part of the story. Okay. But if Papias, uh, Pantaneus valued it so highly as to bring it back with him, why do we hear nothing of it after that? Now, that's just not true at all. We hear plenty about it after that. Okay? But he just, they can say things that they want and just leave it there. And you're at a loss because you think they've really done their homework and they're really researching this and giving you good information, but they're not. Okay? This is fake news right here. This is BS, bad scholarship. Yeah. So now it's an either or. He's going to set up this either or choice that we got. Okay. 
So he brought home no such gospel. Okay? This is the first choice he gives us. Wow. It never happened. Wow. Okay? Or if he did, it was worthless. Okay? It was worthless. Upon further examination. Now, did he make this examination? Did JFB make this examination? The people who have examined this say it's Matthew's gospel and Aramaic. The people that have actually been in contact with the tradition, the history, and actually touched this say, upon examination by the top textual critics of the day say it's Matthew's gospel. This guy has no idea these people, where they are. He says, well, it's not a gospel at all. And if it was, it's worthless, much less Matthew's original. Okay, much less. Look at the words here. Now, they say nothing. Nothing after that? Are you kidding me? Fortunately, in our day and age, we can go back and test that statement. We can fact check that. Okay? Now, thinking about the fact of how remarkable it is that anything has survived from 2,000 years ago, given history that we know, we are fortunate to have anything that's come down to us from 2,000 years ago but actually, in history, that is all we hear from history. As he's already shown us, the seven unbrokable sources that they've had, right? That's all we hear up until the 1800s when this whole thing flip-flops. Every single record that has survived the brutal test of time, 100% is in formidable agreement. I like the word. I'm just going to use it a lot now that Matthew wrote the first gospel in Aramaic to the Jews. Okay? That's 100% of all history. So the JFB mentions seven, formidable chain. Like I say, I want to use that word a lot. I'm going to try and use it every day now. <laughs> this formidable chain clearly identifies Matthew as the author of this gospel. All right? Now... Watch what happens when history is subjected to the bias of this new synoptic problem scholarship. I'm calling it scholarship. I'm just going to call it the synoptic problem of scholarship. Okay? I'm going to put it over right here, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? <laughs> so what I want you to see here is the Pantanus story becomes a myth. All right? The JFB vertigo, which is what? Their dizziness, their giddiness, their lightheadedness continues. Eusebius merely says, Jerome just echoes Eusebius, no such gospel, too worthless, much less as Matthew's original, Greek first, suspicious, we believe. Irenaeus and Jerome merely parrot Papias. Yet, what do we find? Every single testimony and voice considered not only what Papias declared to be a complete Aramaic gospel, but everybody else who got in touch with the Aramaic gospel. So there's no active scholarship involved in these conclusions by the JFB. I'm saying they're polluted. They're all opinions and biased assumptions polluted by blind faith in the modern critical method of the Enlightenment period. All Why right? do they want it to be Greek so bad? I can't understand that. I, because they want to separate Matthew from Jesus as much as possible. Um, so because let's, obviously in that time, if they were speaking Aramaic, he would, I mean, kind of common sense that it would be written in Aramaic. Well, like, that's, 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 that's common sense. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, okay. Also, also spiritual. Yeah, spiritual. Yeah. All right. So let's briefly get into this. <clears throat> so this is part four. We looked at the anarchy. Let's look at um, <clears throat> Pantanus a little bit. And as we said, every single bit of history that survived the test of time, it's unanimous. Um, Matthew wrote first, early Aramaic, and that was undisputed until the Enlightenment, okay, in the, set, in the late 1700s and the beginning of the modern attack of the Bible. We looked at that in part one where Herman Ramirez 
Grand Marus, uh, decided that the apostles were frauds. They made up the stories of Jesus. Jesus was just a wandering Jewish sage that they decided it was a failed Messiah. I wanted to make him into super Messiah. Resurrection is fake, fake. Everything supernatural is wrong. So this, these are the people that are the parents of this entire disease that's floated downstream. So in a river, if you've got a point of pollution that begins, it goes all the way downstream, pollutes it all the way downstream. So there's a beginning point of the pollution, and then it just pollutes everything downstream. So we find it everywhere in our commentaries. For instance, I showed you this commentary before, New Bible Commentary. Uh, the 51 finest premier scholars, and at least that's what they call themselves. And they'll tell you uh, it's unanimous tradition, the early church. We already know that. We've seen it over and over again. We're going to look at it again that the gospel was written by Matthew and Aramaic, and then it was first, okay? These guys, everybody knows, anybody who's a true student will tell you that's exactly the case. But what they also tell you that is there's a now, and that's challenged, okay? The view is challenged. That's all. It's just challenging. So there's key words, unanimous tradition, right? And now widely challenged. So it went from unanimous to now widely challenged. Is that a question? So the, they were saying that the, uh, the Aramaic gospel would have been in Alexandria at some point. That's he brought it to Alexandria. Did it get burned or there's no way to ever... Well, nothing, nothing really. Let's say we're lucky to have anything that survives from that period. Yeah. So I showed you Josephus' uh, not only the Antiquities, but the War of the Jews. I mean, all of his writings, that big old volume, it was like this big. Originally written in Aramaic. There's no copies of that in Aramaic anywhere. Okay? There's none of it. Now, in the Aramaic-speaking East, and we'll get into that in a little bit, and we've talked about this before, the Aramaic amnesia we have, there are still Aramaic-speaking Jews and Christians since the time of Christ who still have the scriptures in Aramaic. But we have amnesia about that whole side of the world. We barely know anything, right? I can barely find my way home. So we have been severed from that history and we don't know that there are churches who have an entire Aramaic Bible that dates back to the time of Christ. We just don't know. Yeah, I saw some guy go back and talk to them and he was asking them questions because he was trying to, and they could answer it because they had the scripture still, still spoke, and I, and still spoke that language. I forget where it was, but it was somewhere obviously. In, not only was it translated into Greek, but multiple other languages that went in, and we showed that I think you know a couple of weeks ago, where I actually brought the book by uh, Bruce Metzger on all the manuscript evidence up to 1000 AD, and there's just thousands and thousands of manuscripts that we have in various languages, um, you know, Syriac for sure, Latin, uh, Coptic, uh, Ethiopian. I, I went through a whole list of them. Because as the gospel went out, according to what Papias says, they just translate as they went, and that's exactly what we find in history. So that was in the previous session. You go back and look those up. So it's unanimous, uh, Matthew first, uh, early, why not? It doesn't take you 20 years to write a gospel that small. The whole purpose of writing it that small is so it can be translated quickly and copied easily, okay? The anarchy, the now means, <clears throat> two, about 200 years now since the introduction of the Enlightenment naturalism, uh, since uh, in the study of the New Testament, which the created of the synoptic problem, but there's no problem until they created it. So what, what does now look like? Now is most scholars don't believe that Matthew wrote the gospel. A committee, some unknown author, maybe multiple authors, some church group, Maybe even what Matthew did was just write a loose collection of sayings of Jesus. And maybe that maybe it was um, Messianic proof text from the Old Testament. Matthew just put together some Old Testament Messianic sayings. And, and then they added legends and Jewish apocalyptic. And, you know, we became embodied somewhere around 80 to uh, 110. Yeah, and then they called it Matthew's gospel simply because Matthew might have wrote the, written a Q document or written some other thing, and it found it in there. And they're just using Matthew's name to give it some authority. That's the way it looks now. So it went from 100% clear, no shadow of a doubt. It's in the library in Caesarea to we don't know anything. So this is scholarship. 
Now, if you're not confused by that, it's unbelievable. It's so confusing. And this is a state that in which we find theology today. Okay. You can't go to school and not study this. You, you'll be forced, you know, to drink from this polluted river. The opinions are so wide ranging that you don't even know where to begin to attack it. And if you don't have the ability to go and look at primary sources, then you don't have anything to balance it with. So then what you have this disorder that results uh, in rejecting history and it's a blatant rejected that affects of history that affects every aspect of New Testament interpretation. So now if you're going to put Matthew in 80 to 85 to 110 and Mark over here, Mark's embellished by all these forms and legends and Luke is somewhere over there. So it's like when you try to go to study the New Testament, it's an absolute mess. You know, you don't actually study the word of God. You study scholars who just confuse you like this to no end. So if you use the JFB, you come out the end and going, I don't know. I know I told you that's where I ended up for you. So this is the, they call this the assured results of over 150 years of research, which as we've seen is speculation, assumptions, dump truck, if maybe it's probably it just seems like we believe. And so it's, it's anti-history. It's the opposite of history. It's against everything that history is all about. And in conclusion, they say, there's no conclusion. That clears it up. Thank you, 51 <laughs> finest. Right? No, seriously. Am I right? <laughs> and, and it just goes on deeper and deeper. So nothing's really changed. So what's happened this? In the 150 years since you know the Enlightenment period, even more so now, this is what we're left with. We don't know who wrote it, we don't know where it was written from, and we don't know the date of composition. So all we all we have is what we don't know. But what we do know is the opposite of history. Matthew didn't write. Wasn't written in Aramaic. Wasn't written for the Jews. Wasn't written early. Was definitely written after Mark. Written in Greek. Not an eyewitness. It was written by someone somewhere. Wow, that's what you get. Okay, multiple choice question, you get an A, okay? So this is a pandemic, okay? It's a theological virus. It's polluted stream entered the river, okay? Everybody still on board? Still sounds awake? Familiar. Huh? Kind of sounds familiar, like what's going on still today. Still. So here's, here's New Bible Commentary, which I said is the 51 finest. And they said the emphasis on the priority of Mark over the last hundred years or so has tended to discount the importance of Matthew and the opinion of scholars. So these are even conservative guys. Okay. The, the, the Doom Bible Commentary, 51 finest conservative English speaking scholars. We've just discounted Matthew, the importance of Matthew. So we don't care about Matthew anymore. Jeez. Matthew's just shredded. Put him in a shredder. Jeez. What do you think is going to happen to the word of God when that happens? You're not studying the Word of God anymore. You're studying scholars. So we have this absolute anarchy, change for the worst. So the history, and if this is, he says, past 100 years or so, which means that in history, the Aramaic Matthew was anchored apostolic truth. Let's say, let's give it 1,800 years, right? So for 1,800 years, that was the theory. Okay, who broke the chain? We looked at this before. Started in the Enlightenment period, huh? Who broke the chains of Bell Pretty much. No, what, what they. Herman Ramarus in Germany is considered the father of the new movement. He's a naturalist. He, he says, I don't believe in Jesus, don't believe he's the Messiah. Yeah, the sorry. apostles are frauds, the resurrection is false. And so they began to examine the gospel stories through a naturalistic and secular lens. So as a result, as naturalists, what do you got to do? You got to do away with the virgin birth. You got to do with the Holy Spirit. You got to do with the miracle. You got to do, uh, you know, the everything about Jesus. And the apostles are so clever, so smart. They created this amazing Jesus for selfish gain. So they're selfish, right? All right. So just briefly, Papias, we said the earliest evidence of gospel origins that we have to this day that we have found so far. I'm praying we'll find more because there's always fine stuff, right? Yeah, I love that. Uh, Papias, look at 60. 
to about 135. Wow. Okay, so he's straddling the apostolic era, right? He's got one leg in apostolic era and one leg in the second century. He was bishop in Hierapolis. We looked at the map of that. It's over on the eastern side of Turkey. Here's what Matthew <laughs> says. Matthew compiled the oracles in the Aramaic language and everyone translated them as well as they could. So we've already gone into this. And this is the beginning point of the shredding of history. So you have to do away with Papias completely. And so then they go off on what Logia was and why it wasn't the gospel. Yes. Do they... Do they actually get rid of Papias, or do they just say that everyone that copies Papias? Yeah, no, you, you, they, he's just counted, minimized. His testimony is not reliable. He doesn't know what he's talking about. What is it about Papias that they can actually discredit about him? There's nothing other than the fact that he gives this very clear reference to an early Aramaic Gospel of Matthew. That's what they don't like. So they're more, they're more like critical about everyone else's copies. Kind of, he's like, Right, since he's the first guy in the chain that we know of yeah. who's made a statement that's come down to us and you know managed to survive this long. So if they are going to promote their synoptic problem, they have to deal with Papias. Like I say, they're gonna do they're gonna do away with Papias, they're gonna do away with their they're gonna do away with Trump, they're gonna do away with Pantanus, and they're gonna go, Pantanus is a myth. Uh you see only said this, Trump didn't mean that. Irenaeus, what does he know? He's just quoting Papias. It just goes on and on like that. But there's no other competing source theory. In other words, there's not two or three different theories. Matthew only wrote one thing. He wrote the gospel. It was in Aramaic. It went out into the world. It was translated by everyone as best they could, copied by everyone as best they could. And that's exactly what history shows, exactly. And there's one unanimous tradition, 100% unanimous and, it's, and it doesn't begin with Papias. Papias is just relaying testimony that's come to him by people who knew apostles. Okay, Papias says, I spoke to everybody that came through town who was in relationship with the apostles to get the best information because I want the living voice. So Papias isn't making up information. He's relaying tradition faithfully. And he's He's highly regarded, wrote books. Some of it came down through other sources to us. Thank God it did. Okay? Yeah. So Papias is only recording and reporting tradition that he received from those who actually knew apostles. Anybody in Germany in the 1800s know any of the apostles? I don't think so. So Paspius also has a lengthy thing that uh, survived about Mark, and this is important for us. We'll look at it some other time, not today, but just to remind yourself, I'll put it in here again, that Mark was the interpreter for Peter, bless his little heart, and Mark was constrained by a church to leave a record of Peter's preaching, the sayings of Jesus Christ. And so he did that. He accommodated his instructor, Peter, who's a preacher in the mission field, didn't give any uh, indication that he's going to do a complete narrative of the life of Jesus. We never do that in missionary situations, do we? No, you preach whatever you feel intuitively at the moment by the Holy Spirit to a particular group of people. You never start from the birth of Jesus to the end. We do that now with the Jesus film, but that's, that's a, an amazing advancement of technology. So they're saying that Mark's chronology was not in order. We'll look at that. We'll compare uh, the harmonies of the Gospels. And you can see that depending on how you key it, that the chronology of certain stories don't flow consistently. They're, in other words, they're not repeating each other in terms of their chronology of events. Okay? So if Mark doesn't have the right chronology, who has the right chronology? If Mark doesn't have the right order, who has it? You have to have a standard. Right? You're measuring against something. If Mark was first and Mark was accepted as the proper chronology, Matthew would have the wrong chronology. Mark's chronology would be used as a standard. So here we find out, because this is in the same context, about the origin of the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. And he says Mark doesn't have the right chronology, but Matthew's was translated, copied by everybody. Okay? No word about uh, the chronology of... Matthew's Gospels.
Okay, so it was not in exact order. So Papias knows the exact order. Papias is familiar with something that was considered to be the exact order. And Marx doesn't fit that. Okay, so keep that in mind as we get deeper into this. But he took special care not to omit anything and not to put anything fictitious into his statements, which contradicts the whole theory that Mark by himself took all these legends and myths and forms and shapes and stories that he just made it burn the campfire and put them all together and made this super apocalyptic messianic Christ dying on the cross, rising from the dead, walking on water and all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, the tradition is set. The preaching of Jesus is clear. Mark's order is not correct, but he hasn't added in anything or taken anything out. So that's important for us to know. Okay. So Papias says there's an official document produced by the apostles in Aramaic. It's translated in Greek and other languages. All right. So the original gospel in Aramaic is preserved in Syriac church in the Aramaic speaking East, which I said, we have amnesia about that. We looked at it in part three. No originals exist of any kind. How could they? You know, we're very fortunate to have the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're hidden jars. They survive because they're hidden away. You know, what a miracle what, what that was. But just because we have no originals doesn't mean that there are no originals. Okay? Every manuscript that we have, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them, all have parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. All right? They originate somewhere. This one here. Maybe we have it from 500. Maybe this one's from 600. Maybe this one's from 1,000. But they all come from downstream somewhere, right? So they found some awesome manuscripts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, you know, written sometime in the fourth century. But even those have parents and grandparents because they're copies of copies. You hear what I'm saying? So we have these are the oldest and best manuscripts preserved, but they are children grandchildren. There is an Aramaic version called the Peshitta that has great grandparents. So really the Aramaic Matthew is not lost. The Aramaic Matthew was copied and continues to be used to this day by the Syriac church of the East. So let's talk about no Aramaic originals. Doesn't mean there's not an Aramaic original. Like I say, Josephus tells us that he wrote in Aramaic. There's no copies of that anywhere. No, yeah, yeah. So they had to be copied, copy because he said I copied them I and I sent them to the east to all the Aramaic speaking Jews, as we saw last session. In the preface to Wars of the Jews, he says, I wrote this within three years of the end of the wars in Aramaic, and I translated into Greek. And I sent it to all the Jews on that side of the world, on the eastern side. But on the western side, I translated into Greek for the Roman side of the empire. So he says, look, I've done two things. This massive book that's that big, I should have brought with me. <laughs> I didn't. You saw it last week. It's, it's huge. And he says, I, I had translated both. So it, came, it kept coming down to us in the west, which was protected from a lot of the, the wars and you know, the atrocities that happened in the East, uh, and it, we still have it, thank God. Did the Orthodox use um, the Aramaic Bible? The Aramaic is used by Syrian churches in the Far East. The Greek Orthodox used Greek. Yeah. Yeah. But because we have this amnesia, we're not taught anything about the Syriac Church of the East. We don't know that they've had the Aramaic a Bible since the time of Christ. And they'll tell you that the gospels that we have in Aramaic, we receive from the apostles themselves, but we don't care about their history. We discount them. Their history doesn't matter to us or to these people. It matters to me. Yeah. So what's the oldest fragment that we have on Matthew of any language? Uh, I can look it up. Okay. Oh, so in Greek? In any language. What's the oldest one that we actually do have? That well, the, these 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 two right now. these these ones, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are like three fifty, oh, wow. somewhere around there, and these are complete Bibles. Yeah, 
And then there's manuscripts before that. And then there's writings that come down that predate this. So it's called, it's called the Diatessaron by Tatian, which was a Bible harmony that was written in Aramaic and later translated in Greek. So that has what is that parents called? and grandparents. What is that called? The Diatessaron. It's really cool. Yeah, that's helpful. Awesome. Yeah, he did that, a really good job. Yeah, he did a harmony. Originally written in, in Aramaic, and then it was translated. People actually used it as their Bible because it right, put all four of them together wow. until they decided, no, we're going to make an official Aramaic Bible called the Peshitta, and then we're going to use that. Okay? So there's a lot to know about this particular interest. So Aramaic was still a vernacular. It didn't, didn't stop, seeing, stop being the language of the Jews or the Eastern world. I showed you the Babylonian Talmud, which is over 5,000 pages written in Aramaic in hand on papyrus, I mean on parchment. Okay, translated, copied, given out. 5,000 pages, 22 volumes. I showed you the one volume, Aramaic. And the Jerusalem Talmud was also in Aramaic. So it's like, what, you can't write a gospel this big? In Aramaic, oh my, uh, these Jews, they just don't know how to write. <laughs> and the Qumran community has 10,000 different fragments and articles out there. You can look up Sinaiticus for me with Chris, okay? So, I love the word vadimikum. It means training manual. So the apostles had this training manual. But let's let's get into Pantanus, okay? Because it's taking me too long. Sorry. So here's the story. All right. Let's not go there. Let's just get right to Pantanus, okay? I'll send you that at some point. So who's Pantanus? He's 180. Okay, where is he? He's late second century. He is the principal of the school of believers in Alexandria. Alexandria is the most celebrated theological school of early Christian scholarship. He is regarded as one of the most eminent teachers of his day. So is he a slouch? No. And he wrote prolific amount of literature, information, Bible commentaries. So this is what we learn from history down here. Number four, that's the introduction of commentaries of origin. And Eusebius also has this in 510 of his history. So Pantanus is the head of the catechetical school of Alexandria, uh, second early, uh, end of the second early years of the third century. He interpreted many books. He was preceded by Clement and Origen. So these guys are all connected together, all right? Pantanus, Clement, Origen. His successors in office. He trained Clement and Origen. Okay? So Alexandrian theology was due in part to his influence. And much of his exegetical work remains extant, means it continued to exist until the time of Jerome. Unfortunately, with the Muslim overtake of the world, burning of libraries and whatnot, we don't have much that survives. So thank God we have anything. Okay, but I want to see who this guy is. So he was supposed to go preach the gospel to people of the East. He went as far as India. We know that from his historical fact. And he found uh, his Aramaic gospel. And so Eusebius confirms that tradition. So Pantanus, he says, went to India. He found the gospel according to Matthew. Bartholomew, one of the apostles, had preached to them, left them the writing of Matthew in the Hebrew language, which was preserved until that time. Okay? Pantanus became the head of the school and expounded the treasures of divine doctrine, both orally and writing. So this guy is an amazing scholar. He's the head of this, this, the, the think tank of Christianity in the early days, okay? So we learn about Bartholomew. He's in the apostolic list. We're told that he went through Arabia all the way to India, okay? The missionary journey. Jesus said, go in all the world, he did it. So in Eusebius' history, 
we learn that Bartholomew took a copy of the Aramaic Gospel, Matthew, on his early missionary journey to India. Okay? What does that mean? Yeah. They published it early. <laughs> enough for yeah, yeah. enough for the yeah, missionaries yeah. to take it with them as they went. Now, do you think Bartholomew is the only one to hand that? Do you think of all the 12 apostles, they threw cast lots and go, okay, Bart, you get it. We're not going to have one. How many copies of Isaiah are there in Qumran? How many copies of Deuteronomy are there in Qumran? How many copies of the Psalms are there in Qumran? You understand what I'm saying? This is like this big. The Gospel of Matthew is like tiny. It's, it's to facilitate copying and translation. So now by the middle of the second century, by the time of Pantaneus and Alexandria, everyone is familiar with the Greek gospel of Matthew. Origen uses it, right? Are you with me? So Greek gospel in the Greek speaking West predominates because that's their language. They wanted it in their own language. Why shouldn't you? They translated the Hebrew 250 BC, the whole Old Testament into Greek Septuagint, right? Because the Jews had spread out the world and Ptolemy wanted it in his Alexandrian library. So he said, hey, translate it for me. I want books. So everyone in Alexandria would be familiar with the Greek Gospel of Matthew. So there's no doubt raised by anyone that the Aramaic Matthew found by Pantanus was a complete version of Matthew. Does that make sense to anybody? If Pantanus has the Greek Matthew and he finds an Aramaic Matthew and calls it the Gospel of Matthew, right? What do you have? You have a complete version of the Gospel of Matthew. You don't have a bit pieces. You don't have Q. You don't have 220... 235 version, you know, verses. You don't have a Old Testament uh, cut up piece. It's the Gospel of Matthew. Bartholomew had it. He found it in India. He brought it back with him. Now, do you think those people in India are going to let Pantaneus bring back their only copy of Matthew? What's he going to do? Getting a copy of himself, bring it back, right? They're going to they're give you your 150-year-old copy that Bartholomew gave them. They're gonna cherish that thing, you know what I'm saying? You're not touching my like you're not touching my copy, right? They're gonna do the same thing the Greeks did. They're gonna copy it. They're gonna copy it. As Jerome said. Yeah, we translate it. They're gonna translate it. Okay. So Alexandria is the center, it's the brainchild of Christianity. So the headmaster of the Alexandrian school would have the best information about the textual quality of the Gospel of Aramaic. What do you say? Do you think he would know what he's talking about? Okay? Had it in his hands. Brought it back with him. Called it the, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, it's not an abbreviated version. It's not a simple Old Testament collection of prophecies. It's not the Q document. It's not a prototype gospel. If it were, we would all know. If it were just a cut up little piece, why bring it back? If it's just Old Testament sayings, what carry it back? Why well, tell everybody it's a gospel? So Pantanus is exceptionally qualified to render a verdict on the text of the precious Aramaic gospel in his hands that he carefully treasured back, brought back with him from India. He would know if the Aramaic Matthew was any different from the Greek Matthew. What do you say? So we can learn a lot from what Pantanus didn't say by his scholarly judgment passed down through the century, centuries as the Gospel of Matthew. It's the Gospel of Matthew. There's no confusion, no contradiction, no wrangling, no what ifs, no maybes. The report is that he has the Gospel of Matthew in Aramaic that was taken to India in the early missionary journeys of the Apostle Bartholomew. So what you want to see, and this is very important, that Pantanus is not parroting a tradition that's passed down by Papias. Do you see that? He's, this is not a tradition. This is the gospel in his hand that he got in India that the tradition is that Bartholomew brought it there. 
How did it get there? Bartholomew brought it here. How do you have this? Bartholomew brought it to us, okay? So he's not an echo of Papias, all right? So how do they end up discrediting him? <laughs> it's a myth. It's a myth. <laughs> it sounds like a mythological story. Did he go to India? We don't know. No, we don't know. We're not even going to look into that because it's all baloney. It's all liver worse. So, crazy. so there's nothing in Pantanus's testimony that has anything to do with Papias other than the fact that here's a copy in Aramaic that Papias says Matthew did, right? So he's not going to Anatola meeting with Papias and say, Papias, tell me what you heard. He's in India, finds Bartholomew. Brings it back, okay? Nothing to do with Papias. So you can't, you know, attach him there <coughs> to that radioactive thing. So Pantanus is independent, is he not? Yes. His critical textual analysis is based upon the actual gospel in his possession. And there's nothing frivolous, vague, mysterious about the Aramaic Matthew. There's no question raised about it. There's nothing minimized about it. I felt, I think like Pontanus feels like Tischendor coming back with Sinaiticus. His mind is blown, he's happy. So why would Pantanius bring back to Alexandria a useless Aramaic doc, uh, document if it was just Messianic quotes? Why would he bring that back and then say it's Matthew's gospel? Okay, he wouldn't do that. And so, and what advantage would Papias accrue if he made up the story, the myth of the Aramaic Matthew? What did he hope to gain? It has the era mythology. Did, did he get money? <laughs> did he like keep it in a little tabernacle and charge people to come see it? <laughs> Something's wrong with the synoptic problem. And I'm calling it the synoptic problem, scholarship problem. So for me, I'm going to trust the analysis of Pantanus, Origen, Irenaeus, Papias, Jerome, the headmaster of the School of Alexandria, who held it in his hands. And that he, was 300? Yeah, feet? no, he's, he's 180. Oh, he's, he's 180. 180. That's right. okay. And Before, then the other guy was 60? Yes, Papi is 60. You know, he was born 60, so he straddles. So Papi is even earlier. Be, before I bow down to liberal enlightenment philosophers from Germany, to me, their opinion means nothing. Zip. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Especially when it was, what, 1,800 years later, you said? There's something when yeah. it started getting all huh? divided. Was it 1800? Yeah, yeah. Or 1800 years later? Yeah, after the, refor after the Reformation. Yeah, it yeah, takes it takes a couple hundred years. You can late 1700s, okay. early 1800s, and then by the by the end of the 1800s, it's taking firm root, and then it's just blown up oh, into conservative yeah. stuff. All right. Lastly, <coughs> Pantanus. I don't know how to pronounce it. That's <laughs> Okay, here's where we want to end up here. In the Syriac Church of the East, all of their scriptures, liturgies, creeds, commentaries are in Aramaic to this very day. George Lamsa wrote in his translation, so he got the Peshitta, which is the Aramaic Bible, translated in English. He said the Assyrian Church was noted for its missions in the Middle East, India, China, it was the most powerful branch of Christendom in the Near East, Palestine, Arabia, Lebanon, Iran, India, and elsewhere. All the literature of this church was written in literary Aramaic. So this is a very important bit of history that's missing in our educational background. We don't know this. So this Eastern Bloc of Christianity, which is here. See, this is all Aramaic speaking 
part of the world here. Now, Greek's going to come and overtake this whole place. So it's going to become a notable language in, in both of these areas, okay? But you're not going to lose your mother tongue just because you're conquered by the Greeks, okay? So what we're finding here is that the Aramaic Matthew would have not very much use in the West because if it was, especially if it was equal to the Greek, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if they don't speak Aramaic, why would they want it other than for historic value and sentimental value, right? Yeah, it's not going to get copied over there. And as war, famine, and pestilence hits the eastern side of it, they're lucky to have any of those things, which they still do. So, so all is split between Greek and Hebrew and all that took place. The West and the East was 360 years after the death of Christ and the death of Christ. No, the, from the, the Western Church, the Eastern Church? Yeah. That was 1054. It took a thousand years for that to happen. It was like one church. But the problem is with the with the Muslim and Persian over, you know, conquest of the world, it makes it harder to travel and to communicate. So there was there's a huge problem in, in that in that area. All right. So we're gonna end with that. We wanna note that Bartholomew had a full copy of Matthew's gospel in Aramaic early enough to take with him to India. There's absolutely no confusion about this. Huh? Jerome. We haven't gotten to Jerome yet. We will. Yeah, no, in that, in the JFB commentary, he says, yeah, he tells us that. But we got some really good things because uh, it's awesome. So if the Aramaic Matthew was a substandard version of the Matthew's Greek, Greek gospel, we would know about it, right? We would know that. Okay. So then we're, we're finished here. The problem with the synoptic problem. The problem with the synoptic problem is that Bar Bartholomew was martyred 17 years before Matthew's gospel was composed in Greek according to their assured results totally ridiculous and no no i'm just saying this is this is the new the new science all right but check this out the hand that penned the gospel of matthew was the very hand that touched the wounds of the resurrected christ and more importantly the apostles certified the gospel of christ as recorded by matthew with their very lives See, signed, sealed, and delivered in their blood. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Is there any way that I can figure out how to end this? <laughs> There's a way. To end this. Is it that one? All right. Thank you.